Tyson Landhofer serves as Senior Counsel and Director of the Center for Academic Freedom with Alliance Defending Freedom. Tyson has represented college students and student organizations throughout the country in defending their freedom of speech, freedom of association, and freedom of exercise. Friends, please welcome from Alliance Defending Freedom, Tyson Longhofer. When you need a hand, we all need somebody to lean on. Thanks, Jeff. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Each one of you is here today because you believe in freedom. But your beliefs, while necessary, are far from sufficient. They must lead to action. Now, to be sure, there's no doubt that it's getting more difficult to take action. We face America's new cancel culture, a euphemism for censorship and raw oppression. It's reminiscent of failed nations, not America. What Americans do and have always done is just the opposite. Live, fight, and even die for the rights of others, even those with whom they disagree. Foremost of these, free speech and religious freedom. Those rights anchor our pluralistic, durable, and free republic. No one, not the government, not society, not a Twitter mob, can take away these freedoms. Our society is grappling with crucial questions about sex, marriage, family, religion, and even whether objective truth exists. The way we answer these questions will affect the health and happiness of every single American. But instead of allowing a robust, open debate, some are trying to silence those who hold orthodox beliefs from the public square. These attacks are relentless and can seem scary. There are a lot of different opinions about how we should respond, but in the end, it's really not that complicated. We must stand, we must fight, we must not waver. Why? Why do the principles of free speech for all and religious liberty for all matter? because there's a human cost when the government fails in its duty to protect everyone's freedoms. America's commitment to religious freedom is one of its greatest contributions to the world, but currently it's in jeopardy. Now before we explore the human cost of what happens when our First Amendment freedoms aren't protected, I wanna make three points about religious freedom. First, religious freedom and the right of conscience benefits everyone, the religious, and the non-religious alike. It protects the Christian as much as it protects the atheist. This is because it's pre-political, inalienable. These rights don't come from the government, but are anchored in the dignity of the human person. And because of this, the government has a duty to protect it. Second, religious freedom inspires and even requires us to promote human flourishing. The reality is that faith, that it is faith that inspires and encourages actions that contribute to human flourishing. And third, disagreement is not discrimination, and the government shouldn't treat it as such. Just because we might disagree with one another, and we will, especially when it comes to very personal issues like faith, marriage, sexuality, and politics, it doesn't mean we can't respectfully disagree. The Supreme Court has explained it this way. The freedom to differ is not limited to things that do not matter much. That would be a mere shadow of freedom. The test of its substance is the right to differ as to things that touch on the heart of the existing order. And issues involving marriage, human sexuality, and religion do just that. So religious freedom and the freedom of speech, these constitutional safeguards promote diversity and tolerance. They don't undermine them. And these safeguards are necessary now more than ever as the clash between the sexual revolution and religious freedom has impacted nearly every profession. Lawyers, pastors, physicians, healthcare professionals, creative professionals, teachers, counselors, religious institutions, and churches. Some of the primary vehicles used to marginalize and silence these individuals are laws that have added sexual orientation and gender identity as protected classes to a state or a city's non-discrimination law in the area of employment, housing, or public accommodations. Seemingly good on their face, but they have a lot of unintended consequences. These laws threaten Americans with severe punishment and even jail time because they seek to live consistent with their beliefs. Alliance Defending Freedom is the world's largest organization dedicated to defending religious freedom. 
We have represented and currently represent many people who are currently who are being threatened by these laws. There's a human cost to these laws. Laws impact real people, but their stories foster courage and help to change and transform hearts and minds. Today I want to share with you the story of one courageous American who has stood up for freedom, even though it has cost him dearly. I hope his story inspires you to cultivate courage, to stand for your neighbor, and defend the right to speak truth. Justice Alito warned, in his, warned us in his dissent to Obergefell that the left will leverage the redefinition of marriage to vilify private individuals who believe marriage is between one man and one woman. Two years later to the day, Christian cake artist Jack Phillips was granted a hearing by the United States Supreme Court. Jack is a cake artist who opened Masterpiece Cake Shop 27 years ago, swiftly earning a reputation for his custom-designed wedding cakes. His deep religious faith guides his work and inspires him to love and serve people from all walks of life. But he can only create cakes consistent with the tenets of his faith. Whether he designs a custom cake rests not on who the customer is, but on what the custom cake will celebrate or express. The state of Colorado ignored this distinction and told Jack he could not decline requests for custom wedding cakes that express a contrary view of marriage to his religious beliefs. Colorado stripped Jack of 40% of his income and most of his employees, ordered him to re-educate his family, and demanded that he report to the government every time he declined to de design a cake. Thankfully, we had a 7-2 victory holding that Colorado displayed clear and impermissible hostility toward Jack's religious beliefs. Unfortunately, Jack's battle didn't end there. Since then, Jack has been targeted two more times, and the third lawsuit is still going on. But enough for me. Jack is here tonight to tell you in his own words what this journey has been like. So please welcome with me a true defender of liberty, Jack Phillips. friends. Huh, Jack? <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> so Jack, it's been quite the eventful few years. I want to start by taking you back to the morning of June 26, 2017, when the U.S. Supreme Court, after a record 13 conferences, decided it would take your case. Tell me about what happened that day. Oh, it was, uh, excuse me, it was uh, just a crazy day. Um, it was the last day of the court session. They break for the summer. I was confident that they were going to announce our case, whether they denied it or accepted it. They granted our case. I get choked up <laughs> like this every time I think about it, but I had nobody to share it with that day. I had to text everybody except for a homeless man who was in my shop. So <laughs> I told him, hey, I get to go to the Supreme Court. He said, yeah, I got to go to court on Wednesday. <laughs> but I didn't need a parole officer, but it was just the beginning of a crazy couple of years. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about your victory and what the years after your win at the Supreme Court has looked like for you. But before we do, let's go back to long before you were facing any lawsuits. Adam Liptak, the Supreme Court correspondent for the New York Times, began a piece about you and Masterpiece Cake Shop with the following statement. Jack Phillips bakes beautiful cakes, and it's not a stretch to call him an artist. Tell us how, how you became a, a cake artist. Well, I always loved art growing up. I liked to paint, I liked to draw, I liked to sculpt. When I was in school, every class that I could, when you got to choose electives, would be in the art room. And then eventually I got to go to work in a bakery because I needed a job after I graduated high school. And, uh, I found that I love baking. And then the owner of the bakery bought out another bakery and brought in cake design and cake decorators. And I'd never seen that before. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to open up a bakery of my own one day, specialize in artistic cakes to help people celebrate you know, their important events and occasions. And I knew it was what it was going to be called. I just knew everything that it was going to look like. And uh, it was went from there. That's awesome. Well, eventually, your dream came true. You founded Masterpiece 27 years ago. Um, tell everybody, what's the significance of the name Masterpiece Cake Shop and, and then your logo? 
Well, as soon as I knew that I was going to open up a bakery and started putting away money and making plans, I also knew at that time that the name of the shop would be Masterpiece Cake Shop because Masterpiece says art, Cake Shop says cake. So you know you're going to come in and you know, hopefully get an, an artistic cake, not a loaf of bread or a pie. But also in that Masterpiece, the first part of Masterpiece is master. And as a new Christian, when this idea came to me, I wanted to create a, a bakery and environment that would honor God in everything I do. And master, to me, reminds me of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he said, no man can serve two masters. And so I know every morning when I think about it, and I go in there and I say, who am I going to serve today? To this day, master and masterpiece rings that to me. Well, we need those reminders every day, don't we? <laughs> every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know this commitment to Christ was foundational to how you wanted to run your business from the very beginning. Um, share, share with us some of the other things that, that you and your wife put together, you know, when you decided to open the Masterpiece, like to how you would honor God with how you ran your business. Well, first thing that we knew we would do, we would be closed on Sundays. And, you know, while we were doing wedding cakes, that also meant we're not going to take orders for wedding cakes on Sundays because that would, you know, my employees would have to work. Um, but we knew that there were other cakes that we wouldn't create. And um, among those would be cakes that celebrate Halloween or cakes that uh, were anti-American or racist. We had numerous discussions on it. Um, but also cakes that would insult or denigrate anybody in any way, shape, or form even people who identify as LGBT. And we just knew that it was the cake that would be um, the issue, rather than if somebody came in and wanted a cake, you know, would never be the person, you know, what cake, what does this message of this cake express? Can we do the cake? Never the person. So it was always, there's always been that issue, that balance going back and forth. So let's fast forward to about nine years ago. State of Colorado decided to come after you because you wanted to create cakes consistent with your conscience, and you declined to create a cake with a message celebrating a same-sex wedding. You lost a significant part of your business and over half your employees because of what Colorado did to you. Tell, tell us a little bit about the difficult times, the, the hate calls and the, and the death threats. Yeah, when we opened the shop, like I said, we knew that we couldn't create cakes that celebrated same-sex weddings, and these two men came in and you know sat down one of them says you know we made introductions david i'm charlie i'm jack what can i do for you we're here to look at wedding cakes it's for our wedding and i knew immediately that that's not a cake that i could create because um, a wedding cake expresses a message at a wedding if you go to a conference room like this and you walk in and you see a cake over here you know that this isn't any kind of a conference it's a wedding and a marriage is to be celebrated so i knew i couldn't create this cake for these two men because of the message that's inherent in a wedding cake. So I tried to tell them, you know, I can you know, create other cakes for you, sell you anything else in my store, but because of the message of this cake, I can't create it. So they stormed out of the shop and flipped me off and swore at me and took me to court. And um, we lost and we lost and ended up going to the United States Supreme Court. But in the interim there, before we got to the court, like Tyson was saying, um, the Civil Rights Commission made a ruling that I had to start creating cakes for same-sex weddings. I had to change my policy, retrain my staff, and I knew that was a decision that I couldn't go, I couldn't start making the cakes for all the weddings that they asked me to. So we had 10 employees the day that David and Charlie came in, went down to four, including myself, and you know, hateful calls were coming in, emails. Death threats just for, you know, just for trying to live according to my faith and my convictions in the Civil Rights Commission's decisions brought all this about. It was a pretty hard, uh, trying time. It was the right decision. It was an easy decision, but the repercussions were difficult. Yeah. Well, eventually, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, as you indicated, ruled against you. You appealed. Colorado Court of Appeals affirmed the decision. Then the Supreme Court of Colorado declined to hear it, but the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear your case. And on June 4, 2018, the Supreme Court ruled for Jack 7 to 2. So we talked about the hard times. Tell us about the good times. How did it feel when 7 to 2 at the Supreme Court? 
again, I was at my shop. I didn't explain this the day that I heard the SCOTUS announcement, but I was by myself, but I got the announcement on my computer. There's a website called SCOTUS blog. Uh, SCOTUS stands for Supreme Court of the US. I'm sure you know that, but I was just looking at the computer and SCOTUS blog, and it was three weeks before the end of the session. I wasn't expecting to get a, a ruling, but then I see, you know, it looks like we have Masterpiece Cake, or we have Masterpiece Cake Shop, and it looks like they win seven to two. It still takes my breath away. I, that was three years ago, but to describe the emotions of that day were it was crazy. We, you know, hundreds of people coming by the shop, phone calls, emails. The support was amazing. Well, it's a great victory, and we are deeply thankful for your perseverance and willingness to take that on. So, Jack, Justice Kennedy wrote in your case that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission displayed a clear and impermissible hostility towards your sincere religious beliefs. And what he was referring to specifically was one of the commissioners called your Christian faith despicable rhetoric and an analogous to supporters of the Holocaust. What was that like when you read that? You know, that may not sound like it should mean a whole lot. You know, it's a horrible thing to say, but my father served, my father fought in World War II. He landed on Normandy. He fought in France, he fought in Germany, he was in the Battle of the Bulge. He got a Purple Heart for a huge uh, mortar wound he sustained on his back, it's just a big jagged scar. They sent him to England, patched him up, sent him back into combat, and he ended up being part of a group that helped liberate Buchenwald uh, concentration camp. And he, he spoke of the horrors of that. I remember him you know, talking about the smell and just, you look up pictures and these places can't begin to describe the horror of that, but uh, he lived there, he saw all that, and for them to compare standing for my faith and just declining to create a cake to celebrate something, you know, that was just ludicrous for them to compare that. And uh, Justice Kennedy pointed that out. He did, he did. Well, unfortunately, the story doesn't end at the Supreme Court. Just when you thought it was over, you had a complaint filed against you by an attorney who wanted you to design a cake with a blue exterior and a pink interior to, to celebrate a gender transition. It's hard to believe that the state would ignore the court's decision and cont continue to pursue you, but um, they did initially, and thankfully, uh, after we got involved, they agreed to dismiss the charges when further evidence of their additional hostility towards religious freedom was discovered. But as, that, as if that wasn't enough, the harassment continues. Rather than appealing the commission's decision to dismiss the case against Jack, attorney Autumn Scardina filed a lawsuit against Jack and Masterpiece Cake Shop in state court. Now, many of the claims are similar to the now dismissed complaint this same attorney filed against you in 2017. So talk to us about how you're feeling with this third case that's been filed against you. You had an intense several months uh, preparing for the trial that, that you had earlier this year. Yeah, so preparing for the trial was just something. I'd, I've never been in court like that, you know, traffic court a couple of times with my son and different things, but to prepare for the court, we also went through mediation. We had a deposition, and if you've never heard about a deposition or understood what it is, it's six hours the other side gets to put you in a, in a stand and cross-examine you and grill you and try and twist your words and trap you. And so we had to go through all that. I had to watch my wife go through all that and then go through the trial, the same thing, where they're examining my, you know, making my wife testify, and she's on the stand, and then my daughter's on the stand, and I'm on the stand, and when they're on there, I just have to sit there with my hands folded because we did it Zoom, and so they can see, make sure I'm not coaching them, and just to watch that kind of thing go on, somebody trying to destroy your wife, it was hard. But, quick commercial for ADF, they were there <laughs> preparing us for all this, and they were there, they've been there since 2012 when this all started, so. We were ready for it. Well, we're, we are honored to stand by you and your family, Jack. Unfortunately, earlier this week, the court ruled against Jack in this third case. Now, we are disappointed in this ruling, but the fight is not over. Jack will be appealing this decision. I think Jeff's got a question for you. 
Jack, I get to ask you a few questions about your book here real quick. He's got a new book out called The Cost of My Faith, How a Decision in My Cake Shop Took Me to the Supreme Court. Got a chance to read this book. It is just wonderful, Jack. Tell me a little bit about Jesus Christ, especially in the blue Mustang. Jesus met you in a blue 66 so. <laughs> Mustang, I believe. Because I get this, before you say, I, I get this question a lot. You guys, do you know Jack Phillips? I say, I do know Jack. So how does he keep going? I say, you got to read this book. You understand a man who had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's not going to waver. So tell us a little bit about your book. That's chapter seven in The Cost of My Faith. But there's also, by disclaimer, there's an endorsement by Jeff Hunt in the front of the book. Because, <laughs> and then uh, part of the story then, my, my coming to faith in Jesus Christ was I worked at this bakery. I worked nights. You know, one of the guys said, you want to go over to the bar after work? And I said, no, I think I'll just head home. So this was like 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. Sometime in the spring, I don't know the exact day. But I do know, oh man, I do know the exact moment. But I'm just driving down Kipling and headed towards Wheat Ridge where we lived. And suddenly the Holy Spirit was in my car. I know that sounds... I know how it sounds, but he convicted me of my sin in that moment. And I had gone to church, you know, growing up, but I quit going to church when I was like 17. And uh, I was this, at this point, I think I was 23. And I'm married, I have two kids, working my job, doing, you know, making a living and taking care of my family. I'm not an alcoholic, a drunk, or, you know, we we're going to go to the bar, but I'm responsible for paying my bills and trying to be a good dad. But God pointed out my sin to me, and I say, sin, not my sins plural, but my sin nature. And at that moment, I understood all the Sunday school lessons that I'd heard that I was a sinner in need of a savior, and that was Jesus Christ. And there was no other way. Um, but I decided to negotiate. <laughs> so I said, you know, let me clean up my life. You'll get a better deal. He said, you can't. There's nothing I could do. I knew that in that moment. You can't. You're right. I'm yours. So at that moment, I was saved. I was born again, but I still had two, three minutes before I got home, which would be another problem because I'm going to walk into my, our apartment. And my wife would be there with our two toddlers. They were probably sleeping at the time, baby and a toddler. And uh, working nights, I would just go home, make my greetings, go to bed, and go to sleep, and I'd be asleep just like that. Well, God told me, go tell your wife what you've just done. And I you know, that's not a good idea. She'll probably, <laughs> she'll probably walk out on me, you know, because just a few weeks before, my sister-in-law had invited her to church, nothing more. And my wife blew up at her, like, oh, Christians are all hypocrites and all this stuff. And like, if that's the reception she gets for just inviting me to church, what's going to happen when I tell her this life-changing experience? <laughs> so I go home. I'm not going to tell her now. I'll tell her later, Lord. I go to bed. I can't go to sleep, and to this day, I'll go to sleep tonight. I'll close my eyes, and I'm gone. That day, I couldn't. He said, go tell her. I can't. Let me sleep. We'll do this a little bit later. You know, we'll go from there. Go tell her now. I'll be with you. So I went out into the kitchen. She looks up at me as surprised that I was awake as I was surprised to be awake. I'm like, what are you doing here? This is probably how I told her, too. <laughs> So I became a Christian today, expecting her, I don't know what I was expecting, but she said, me too, three days ago. Uh, so, more detailed description in chapter seven, but that all took place in my 1966 blue Mustang on my way home. You point that out, but it was irrelevant where it was. It was as real as any experience could ever be. Jesus. And Jesus that's what, us. Go ahead. That's what caused me to change my life, change my attitude towards my marriage, the direction I raised my kids, the way I handle my money, and eventually when we opened the shop, why I wanted to honor God in everything that I did because that day. Mm. Yeah. Jesus Christ is not uh, a faraway idea. He was very personal. Yeah. He met me, changed my life. I felt like I got hit by a train. I remember 
that experience and felt like my heart got changed. I became a totally different person. Family didn't know what to do with me. Met you, changed your life, and then through you has changed the world because of your faithfulness. Praise God. Praise God. Now, Biff had a question. We were talking backstage, and uh, it's not quite as important as a question about talking about Jesus Christ, but it's a pretty important question. So, Biff, go ahead. It's super important, man. I want to know why your gluten-free cakes are so delicious. (laughs) You know, I've been doing this. I was thinking about this question. I've been doing this for 45 years since I first walked into a bakery, and there's a lot that happens that I have no control over or I have a lot of knowledge of. I just think God protects me so that I can make good stuff so you can come in and enjoy it. And that's not the front thing in my mind. The front thing in my mind is how am I going to honor him and when I make them and serve you when you come in. Well, your gluten-free cakes, they do glorify God. So good. I, I will say amen to that. And I would say they're good for you, but I'm no doctor. Amen. Thank you for making those. Thank and thank you, you for being faithful. Thank you.